The day previous, he had ridden into Doris's store, and on being requested to leave, he drew his revolver and threatened to kill the gentleman who spoke to him. Another saloon he had led his horse into, and buying a bottle of wine, he tried to make the animal drink it. This was not considered an, an uncommon performance, as he had often entered saloons and commenced firing at the lamps, causing a wild stampede. A leading member of the committee met Slade and informed him in the quiet, earnest manner of one who feels the importance of what he is saying. Slade, get your horse at once and go home, or there will be hell to pay. Slade started and took a long look and with his dark and piercing eyes at the get gentleman. What do you mean, said he. You have no right to ask me what I mean, was the quiet reply. Get your horse at once and remember what I tell you. After a short pause, he promised to do so, and actually got into the saddle. But being still intoxicated, he began calling aloud to one after another of his friends, and at last seemed to have forgotten the warning he had received and became again uproarious, shouting the name of a well-known courtesan to, in company with those, of, in company of, with those of two men whom he considered heads of the committee, as a sort of challenge, perhaps however, as a simple act of bravado. It seems probable that the intimation of personal danger he had received had not been forgotten entirely. Though, f though fatally for him, he took a foolish way of showing his remembrance of it. He sought out Alexander Davis, the judge of the court, and drawing a cocked derringer, he presented, presented it at his head and told him that he should hold him as a hostage for his own safety. As the, as the judge stood perfectly quiet and offered no resistance to his capture, no further outrage followed on this score. Previous to this, on account of the critical state of affairs, the committee had met and at last resolved to arrest him. His execution had not been agreed upon at that time, and at that time would have been negative, negative, negatived most assuredly. A messenger rode down to Nevada to inform the leading men of what was on hand, as it was desirable to show that there was a feeling of unanimity on, on the subject all along the gulch. The miners turned out almost in mass, leaving their work and forming a solid column, about 600 strong, armed to the teeth. They marched up to Virginia. The leader of the body well knew the temper of his men on the subject. He spurred on ahead of them and hastily called a meeting of the executive. He told them plainly that the miners meant business and that if they came up, they would not stand in the street to be shot down by Slade's friends, but that they would take him and hang him. The meeting was small and the Virginia men were loath to act at all. The momentous announcement of the feeling of the lower town was made to a cluster of men who were deliberating behind a wagon at the rear of a store on Main Street. The committee were most unwilling to proceed to extremities. All the duty that they had ever performed seemed as nothing to the task before them. But they had to decide, and that quickly. It was finally agreed that if the whole body of miners were of the opinion that he should be hanged, that the committee left it in their hands to deal with him. Off at hot speed rode the leader of the Nevada men to join his command. Slade had found out what was intended, and the news sobered him instantly. He went into P.S. Puff's store, where Davis was, and apologized for his conduct, saying that he would take it all back. The head of the column now wheeled into Wallace Street and marched up at quick time. Halting in front of the store, the executive officer of the committee stepped forward and arrested Slade, who was at once informed of his doom, and inquiry was made, inquiry was made as to whether he had any business to settle. Several parties spoke to him on the subject, but to all such inquiries he turned a deaf ear, being entirely absorbed in the terrifying reflections on his own awful position. He never ceased his entreaties for life and to see his dear wife, the unfortunate lady referred to between whom and Slade there existed a warm affection, was at this time leave, living at their ranch on the Madison. She was possessed of per considerable personal attractions, tall, well-formed, of graceful carriage, pleasing manners, and was withal an accomplished horsewoman. A messenger from Sl Slade rode at full speed to inform her of her husband's arrest, 
In an instant, she was in the saddle, and with all the energy that love and despair could lend to, the, to an ardent temperament and a strong physique, she urged her fleet charger over the twelve miles of rough and rocky ground that intervened between her and the object of her passionate devotion. Meanwhile, a party of volunteers had made the necessary preparations for the execution in the valley traversed by the branch. Beneath the site of Pofs and Russell's stone building, there was a corral, the gateposts of which were strong and high. Across the top was laid a beam to which the rope was fastened, and a dry goods box served for the platform. To this place Slade was marched, surrounded by a guard composing the best armed and most numerous force that has ever appeared in Montana territory. The doomed man had so exhausted himself by tears, prayers, and lamentations that he had scarcely strength left to stand under the fatal beam. He repeatedly exclaimed, My God, my God, must I die? Oh, my dear wife. On the return of the fatigue party, they encountered some friends of Slade, staunch and reliable citizens and members of the committee, but who were personally attached to the condemned. On hearing of his sentence, one of them, a stout-hearted man, pulled out his handkerchief and walked away, weeping like a child. Slade still begged to see his wife most piteously, and it seemed hard to deny his request, but the bloody consequences they were sure to, that were sure to follow the inevitable attempt at a rescue that her presence and entreaties would have certainly incited forbade the granting of his request. Several gentlemen were sent for to see him in his last moment one of whom, Judge Davis, made a short address to the people, but in such low tones as to be inaudible, save to a few in its immediate vicinity. One of his friends, after exhausting his powers of entreaty, threw off his coat and declared that the prisoner could not be hanged until he himself was killed. A hundred guns were instantly leveled at him, whereupon he turned and fled, but being brought back, he was compelled to resume his coat and to give a promise of future peaceable demeanor. Scarcely a leading man in Virginia could be found, though numbers of the citizens joined the ranks of the guard when the arrest was made. All lamented the stern necessity which dictated the execution. Everything being ready, the command was given. Men, do your duty. And the box being instantly slipped from beneath his feet, he died almost instantaneously. The body was cut down and carried to the Virginia Hotel, where in a darkened room it was scarcely laid out when the unfortunate and bereaved companion of the deceased arrived at headlong speed to find that all was over and that she was a widow. Her grief and heart-piercing cries were terrible evidences of the depth of her attachment for her lost husband, and a considerable period elapsed elapsed before she would regain the command of excited feelings. There is something about the desperado nature that is wholly unaccountable. At least, it looks unaccountable. It is this. The true desperado is gifted with splendid courage, and yet he will take the most infamous advantage of his enemy, armed and free. He will stand up before a host and fight until he is shot all to pieces. And yet, when he is under the gallows and helpless, he will cry and plead like a child. Words are cheap, and it is easy to call Slade a coward. All executed men who do not die game are promptly called cowards by unreflecting people. And when we read of Slade that he had so exhausted himself by tears, prayers, and lamentations that he had scarcely strength left to stand under the fat fatal beam, the disgraceful word suggests itself in a moment, yet infrequently defying and inviting the vengeance of banded Rocky Mountain cutthroats by shooting down their comrades and leaders and never, never offering to hide or fly. Slade showed that he was a man of peerless bravery. No coward would dare that. Many a, a notorious coward, many a chicken-livered poltroon, coarse, brutal, degraded, has made his dying speech without a quaver in his voice and been swung into eternity with what looked like the calmest fortitude. And so we are justified in believing 
from the low intellect of such a creature that it was not moral courage that enabled him to do it. Then if moral courage is not the requisite quality, what could it have been that this stout-hearted slave lacked, this bloody, desperate, kindly-mannered, urbane gentleman, who never hesitated to warn his most ruffinly enemies that he would kill them whenever or wherever he came across them next, 